Welcome to this first module, this first video in my online tensor analysis or tensor algebra course. Um, this serves as an introduction and the objective here is to answer a pretty fundamental question which is what is a tensor? Um, and I think that's an important question to answer if we're going to be studying those. Now um, we're going to provide a formal answer to that question in later modules and we will hint at a formal answer to that question here. But predominantly in this module, we're going to be exemplifying it using an example system. And that system is pretty simple. We're going to look at someone throwing a ball from point A to point B, and then that's going to calculate how the velocity changes between point A and point B um, over a relatively short time window. Um, now we're going to take that system and we're going to represent it in two different ways. The first is using traditional matrices or a traditional matrix-based equation. And you should have probably seen this in an undergraduate linear algebra course. The second is a tensor-based equation. And what we're going to show is that the latter allows us to do some pretty cool things, such as incorporate within that equation the effect of rotating the second or the B-side observer's point of view. And uh, I think this example will allow us to answer the question of what is a tensor without getting bogged down in a lot of the formal terms and language that may not come across very well in this first module. I have written a text to accompany these lectures. Um, when it's available, you'll find a link in the description below. Unfortunately, if you're watching this video close to the time of release, uh, the text may not be available yet. But keep checking back and I'll put those details in the description as soon as they're available. Uh, if you have any questions or corrections, I strongly encourage you to place them in the comment section below. And please, um, you know, subscribe if you appreciate these videos and want to see more of this kind of content. Let's dive into this tensor introduction for non-mathematicians. This presentation, as the title suggests, is aimed at non-mathematicians, such as engineers like myself. I do have an accompanying text, the details of which will be available in the description below. Uh, unfortunately, that link is not available yet. I'm still working on the publication venue, um, but I hope to have details on that soon. So if you're watching this video close to the time at which it was put out, unfortunately, you may not have access to the text yet. So this presentation attempts to do a couple of things. We want to use layman's terms whenever possible. This is not aimed at mathematicians, although it is aimed at people with technical background. So we're gonna to try to use the most simple language possible while remaining accurate. We want to address more introductory and fundamental concepts, um, maybe more so than would be done in a text for mathematicians. We're gonna talk about contracted tensor product a bit, for example. We're gonna present expanded element-based forms of algebraic objects whenever possible. So instead of describing an equation in the most concise form as just, and again, this is very simple, A times X, we're going to try to break it out and show the individual elements and show what happens or how those elements behave to certain operations being applied to them. And the goal is to use those expanded forms as an alternative to the really concise mathematical notation that personally I don't always understand at first glance. We're going to employ a lot of examples to demonstrate how certain operations may be performed. So this is a very interesting question. What is a tensor? And I think that the term tensor is used in a lot of ways in science and engineering. Uh, not all of them are 100% accurate. A lot of times tensor is used as a stand-in or a synonym to a matrix. Um, a lot of times you'll see, you know, when you have higher order like cube 3D matrices, you know, those will often be referred to as tensors. Those definitions aren't even necessarily wrong. They're just only accurate or only correct under certain assumptions. One of the main ones being that you're using standard basis. So we're going to try to clear that up. Now, later on, we are going to answer this question, what is a tensor in more formal terms? But for now, we're going to employ an example. So let's consider an array called VA that represents the initial velocity of some sphere or some ball. All right. And it's moving within a traditional three dimensional space. We have X, we have Y, and we have Z directions. We are 
going to create an expression which allows us to calculate the post update velocity using a gross approximation of air resistance and gravity effects. So what are we talking about? You have a ball at time TA. It uh, moves forward in time by some time step delta T and it ends up in another location at a time TB. And what we have is the velocity VA is observed over here. The velocity VB is observed over here. Now we're taking into account two different effects. One is going to be air resistance, which is going to attempt to reduce that velocity in the X and Y directions by 0.1% per second. And then we have gravity, which is going to reduce the upward velocity only by 25% per second. Now, I know this is not how physics works. We're going to pretend that physics works this way, um, mostly because, you know, this is not a physics lecture. We're just trying to find a good equation that we can use to demonstrate some concepts. So this is not 100% inaccurate. You can make the equation work with very specific initial conditions and assumptions for a very short window of time. But again, let's just pretend that this is an okay description of this ball moving from some point A to point B. Now here below is the expression and we're going to see it's limited in some way. So we have our velocity VB, we have our velocity VA, and then we have this matrix B1, which maps VA to VB. And we scale that by the length of the time step, which is called delta T. Now we're going to assume that the first element represents velocity in the X direction, second element in the Y direction, third element in the Z direction. And we're also assuming the Z direction is we're moving upward. Otherwise the gravity would speed us up instead of slowing us down. Anyway, and so we can see we have a 0.1% reduction in speed in the X direction, a 0.1% speed reduction in speed in the Y direction, and a 25% reduction of speed in the Z direction, assuming again that we're moving upward. And that gives us our VB or the uh, velocity after the update. Now, the velocities described by VA and VB must be quantified with respect to some predefined referential directions. We don't explicitly state them here, but because we created this expression, we know they represent X, Y, and Z. All right. Now the blank slides, you may be asking why I have all these. It's just to give myself some room to draw if I want to add some context. So we can adapt the previous equation to include referential directions as shown below. Really what we're adding is two matrices, B sub B arrow hat and B sub A arrow hat. And if we take a look at what is shown right here, we can calculate the product of those two, the matrix and the array. And what we would end up with is V A one times X plus B A two times y plus va3 times z and that gives us our direction our final vector and so this form should be familiar to those of us with linear algebra background and hopefully now we understand the relationship between the va and the b sub a arrowhead right the basis as we call this matrix right here the basis provide the direction that's being applied uh, to the individual coefficients or the axes to which our coefficients are being projected. Over here we have our, sorry, over here we have our second, our post update velocity. And then, like I said before, we have our the, the length of our time step as well as this same matrix which maps VA to VB. Why do we not have to change this matrix B1? Because for now we're using standard basis. I'm gonna leave it there. Um, we're gonna talk more about standard basis later. So we have VB, the vector VB is equal to the vector VA times the length of the time step and this B1 matrix which represents air resistance as well as gravity. So 
Now, what if the slope or the grading of the land changes as the sphere travels, as the ball travels? So, so far, we've kind of been assuming that we have two people on a relatively flat surface. All right. The ball travels from here to here, okay, within some sort of time step. And both the person throwing, or let's say the referential direction, and the person observing, they both use the same axes. We have X, Y, and Z, and we have same thing over here. All right, but what if the land did that? And we have someone standing over here. The ball still travels. I'm not really worried about the path. I mean, I guess it would aim downward a little bit, but it's really not important. So we have VA, we have VB, we have VA, and what this person observes is not necessarily going to be the same VB we have over here. It is the same VB, but this person now, their axes are going to be rotated. Okay. And specifically in this case, we're rotating around the axis, uh, the Y axis. So what this person observes is not going to necessarily be the same VB. They're going to observe their own version of VB, which is specific to these axes down here. And let's give these new names. I'm going to call this P, Q, and R instead of X, Y, and Z. So that's the question we're asking here. What if the slope or the grading of the land changes as the ball travels? To account for changes in the observer's perspective, the velocities must be calculated with respect to the axes that reflect the slope for the observer. Um, and that's because, right, our observer is going to be taking measurements that are specific to their orientation. So the equation below defines new axes, which we call B post D right after the rotation in terms of the old basis. So over here, right, this person, when they're observing, they're using B sub B, the original basis or the same as that which is seen over here. And this person is going to be B post B, right? They're using their own different set of axes. And what we can see is there's a transform that we can define, and this is just taken from a textbook, right? It reflects the rotation of theta degrees around a y-axis. And that's why there's a one right here, because the y-axis is not moving. So theta represents the angle of the rotation around the y-axis. And we start off with our original Sorry about that. We start off with our original X, Y, and Z axes, and we rotate them to create our new P, Q, and R axes. So, now that we've done that, let's compare our two systems. So our first system model is limited because it prevents us really from rotating the axes to account for the change in the observer's perspective. We can't, uh, in implement our P, Q, and R for this model because there's nowhere that we have axes present. Our revised system model does not have this limitation, right? We can replace what's in the green circle with P, Q, R, right? We used to have X, Y, Z. Now we have P, Q, and R. Now you'll note that it's not enough to simply change the axes we also have to change the values observed right here. Both of these two need to change because the axes will be different as well as the observations that are made. Now, if we do this calculation in the correct way, we don't need to change anything over here. And this allows us to creep closer to the concept of tensor algebra. So to fully demonstrate the effect of this rotation, 
What we're going to do is we're going to group both the basis sets. So we're going to start using that term basis set, right? That's what we're calling BA and BB as well as the B post B. Okay. Um, we're going to group those with the matrix B1. So what I did was I took the B post B, which used to be over here. I inverted it and I move it over here. And then I take the BA and I simply just group it in with that. So now in between these parentheses, we have the product of the basis associated with the observer, but inverted, the original linear map, as well as the basis associated with the input. And we can't forget about our delta t. So the result shown below reformulates the second model, the, the former, or sorry, the latter, um, in terms of a new matrix, which we call B2. So all this together um, in between the orange highlighted parentheses is this new matrix that we call B2. So now let's let's play around with this a little bit more. I, I want to make one quick substitution. If you see right here, we have our updated set of bases inverted. And previously we showed that we could use this equation to define our new basis in terms of our old. So what we're doing is we're taking this whole chunk right here, okay, what I just circled, and we're substituting it in right here. I'm sorry, this is getting messy. I'll try to circle it extra. We're, we're, we're substituting it in right there, which is the same as substituting it in right here, except inverted, and that yields the form we see on this slide where originally we had B post B inverted. I forgot the arrow hat where it got cut off. And that is the product of two terms. Our original basis X, Y, Z, which we called B, B, okay, but inverted. And we have the rotation matrix. Now, the reason why the ordering of them is shifted is because we inverted it and so uh, you know, the inverse of A times B is equal to the inverse of B times the inverse of A. But what we end up with is this expression right here. So the velocities that are observed in terms of the new observer's point of view orientation is equal to delta T times the inverted original basis, the inverted rotational matrix, the original map, and then the original basis. And we can't forget to multiply the beginning um, velocities. But contained within these parentheses is a new map, right? Which takes the old velocities in terms of the original basis, basis and generates new velocities in terms of the new basis. Now, why do I have an X? over these two i'm not going to explain in detail but we, we can see if we run the math that these two cancel out so the first and last terms of matrix b2 cancel out leaving the result below so now we have the vb the post update velocities in terms of whatever perspective the observer has we can define that in terms of the original va and there's only two, well, there's three elements we have to worry about, right? We still have the length of the time step. We still have the original map right here. And now we can implement the rotation. So uh, we call this matrix B post one, which I guess is the same as B2. I guess I gave them two similar names, but that's fine. And so this matrix B post one considers our theta explicitly the rotation and so now what we have is a mapping again between the original velocities in terms of the original referential directions 
We map that to the new velocities in terms of the new ref referential directions in terms of our theta as a nice matrix equation. But we were only able to derive that because we had basis included in that model originally. So the result below is taken uh, directly from the bottom of the, the previous slide. And what it does, it allows us, and this is a little bit of repetition, I, I apologize, but it allows us to simulate the velocity of this sphere or ball for a single time step with consideration of how the grading and the velocity's referential directions change as dictated by theta with the sphere's location. Right, the desired rotation is defined here. So what's the difference? We still haven't answered the question of what is a tensor. We're getting very close. So what's the difference between a traditional matrix and a tensor? We're gonna propose that the difference may be illustrated by comparing the two equations to the right, where I'm gonna call this the matrix equation, and I'm gonna call this the tensor-based equation. And as you can see, what's the main difference right, is the presence of these bases right here. And the bases in turn allow us to manipulate the referential direction. So the top is composed of traditional matrices with no embedded information on the referential directions. Without context, we really can't perform any axis rotation. Now, we do have context, so we could technically do it if we wanted to, but without that context, we can't. And the bottom is composed of tensors with embedded info on referential directions. As such, we may account for the observer's perspective. And the difference is the circled green, uh, is the element within the green circle, which are the basis sets. So objects VA and VB without the arrow hat on top are mere column arrays whose values describe some velocities reference to some assumed set of referential directions. We don't know what those are. And they must respond to change of basis. If this was originally assumed to be a flat ground over here for this VB, and then we make it a sloped ground, this no longer applies. The bottom expression, okay, employs VA hat and VB hat, right? And these are vector type tensors whose values are invariant to change of basis because those bases are embedded within it. This VB right here does not change with the user's perspective. And the reason for that is because the basis would change and the observations would change, but the product of the two would stay the same. So in short, Tensors are algebraic, and this is not a formal definition. Tensors are algebraic objects whose composition from basis sets and coefficient arrays or matrices facilitate advanced calculations that involve, can involve, changes to the observer's point of view. And obviously we can extend that from simply changes to the observer's point of view to more complex change of axes or transformation of basis, not only to account for, you know, an observer moving, but also to make certain calculations easier and um, essentially redefine our system in different terms.